Good evening. I'm Simon Best. I'm the Head of Learning here at Woodbrook. And I'm delighted to introduce our first plenary this evening. Our speaker this evening is Gerald Hewitson. Gerald lives on the island of Anglesey in North Wales. He's a father of four. And until his retirement, he was a teacher and then a deputy head in a secondary school in Hollyhead where he helped to found and nurture a now flourishing Quaker meeting. He served on several yearly meeting committees and regularly offers courses here at Woodbrook. He's contributed articles to The Friend and to Friends Quarterly. With his wife Gwyneth, he was resident friend at Pendle Hill in 2011. In 2013, he gave the Swarthmore Lecture, which is Britain Yearly Meeting's annual public lecture, which is supported by Woodbrook as part of our learning programmes. That lecture, like Gerald's plenary tonight, is offered as prepared ministry rather than an academic paper. Gerald's plenary is on From a Deep Place, Reflections on Actions and the Quaker Way. In a moment, I will sit down and Gerald will speak when he is ready. After he's spoken, there'll be an opportunity for us to share our reflections and contributions, rather than that being questions and answers. So, Gerald Hewitson on Reflections on Actions and the Quaker Way and Gerald will speak when he is ready. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I always enjoy receiving invitations to speak. It gives me an opportunity to think through where I am in relation to the spirit. Though I am always conscious of T.S. Eliot's caveat. One always only has to learn, I'll start that again. One has only learnt to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say. We are given words to describe past experience, not capturing the immediate and vital power of the spirit abundantly spilling through the present moment. <clears throat> and I'm also conscious of wondering if I have anything useful to say. Someone once generously called my writing poetic storytelling, and I wondered what a poetic storyteller could offer such a distinguished academic audience. Especially since I am now retired from what for me was an exhausting involvement with our education system. My issues of working in a state school in a deprived area in a depressed region on the far west coast of Britain belong to another part of my life. Most of you are still engaged in taking those difficult decisions in complex situations that are needed to provide an education for your scholars. And hopefully you're more engaged in a more centred way than I was. For during that part of my life, I can now see that I was not drawing on the inexhaustible wellsprings of God's loving purpose. And my final caveat is that I'm very keenly aware that the words we use say as much about ourselves as they do about any objective reality. Ian McGilchrist, on his book on right and left hemispheres of the brain, puts it this way. 
The model we choose to understand something determines what we find. How we think about ourselves and our relationship to the world is already revealed in the metaphors we unconsciously choose to talk about it. Our first leap determines where we land. I leap from and therefore land at a very different place of even a few years ago, let alone where I was as a young man. Particularly the young man who went to university so spectacularly unprepared for what he would find. I'm one of those people who really enjoyed his university days. My flatmates were slightly older and certainly much cleverer than I was. I envied what I now recognise as their left hemisphere capacities for focused attention and abstract reasoning. I admired their rich vocabulary and their ability to think logically. And I have to say that's what I appreciated about my university lecturers, their efforts to help me to think more clearly. I distinctly remember a distinguished professor of medieval history. He was really distinguished. Sitting down with me, some snotty-nosed kid from South Yorkshire, working through a completely un, uh, unremarkable first-year essay, and working through my precise use of words, asking me why did I use that word, or that word, or that word. And what he was trying to do was to help me use language more precisely in order to help me think more clearly. It wasn't just that the emphasis was on training an untutored mind. I would say there was also an underlying presumption about the nature of the world around us and our approach to it. Brian Boyd, in considering the function of narrative in human society, captures this well. He's looking at the Odyssey as a fundamental text in Western literature. And he says, in Homer, the comprehensive vision is in principle humanly obtainable, even if we do not have access to all relevant mortal facts. He contrasts this with the Bible, or as he phrases it, the Hebrew text. God's will is inscrutable, permanently unknowable, except when he chooses to reveal it, and even then remains of an order fundamentally beyond human fathoming. And as a young man, I inclined to this sense that human beings were ultimately capable of understanding everything. As I get older, I find I'm increasingly amazed at the mystery of ordinary life. And as, he, as I reflect on this, it occurs to me that perhaps the focus on simply developing my mind offered me only a partial education. You see, even though I studied English literature and so included a considerable number of novels, we talked about these stories in analytical, abstract terms. I didn't recognise at the time, and I don't remember being taught, that story itself was an important mode of learning. Jonathan Sachs says that only the gifted few can fully understand a philosophical classic. Everyone can relate to a story. And he concludes that only stories adequately reflect what it is to be human. My good friend Sheila says it this way, stories are able to elucidate human experience in ways which theoretic positions might be more challenged to do. We can often identify with and find commonality in recognising dilemmas and personal challenges experienced by others. Through entering that space, we can shift from feeling different and distanced to a sense of connection, commonality, and shared humanity. Stories work at a deeper level than our conscious minds. 
I think Quakers know this instinctively as part of their DNA. It seems to me that we Quakers eschew creeds because we indeed eschew abstraction in favour of the narrative of lived experience. Let's listen to Melvin Kleiner as he opens up the abstruse writings of Isaac Pennington for the general reader. Since Pennington's work is rich in metaphor, Melvin Kleiner is helping us understand key points about metaphorical writing, but I think what he says might equally apply to stories. For example, metaphor, like story, opens us up to the potential for change, but without insisting on the nature of that change. Metaphor and story allow freedom for the reader to develop the meaning in their own lives. He says that Quakerism, from its inception, has depended upon powerful metaphors to bring people into and sustain them within the Quaker movement, to transform them from self-directed individuals to a spirit-led people, to connect them with each other and the larger world. BYM Faith and Practice communicates the sense of a spirit-led people through a series of stories. There is the story of Nayla being called from the plough. The story of Howgill discovering the kingdom of heaven amongst very ordinary Quakers in the north. There's the story of Mary Dyer hanged for her faith. And that of the small and very determined Lucy E. Harris, hectoring, standing on a boat in the middle of the river and hectoring opposing Chinese warlords until they give up their fight and go away without engagement and loss of life. But my favourite story is that of William Dent. William Dent was a tenant farmer. He and his family were known to be the salt of the earth. But what could a plain tenant farmer accomplish in a small village, aloof from the life of the world? At a time when he settled in it, several of the houses were in an insanitary condition. The labourers had no gardens to speak of, the children had no school, but there was a public house for the parents. When, at four score years and ten, his call came to go higher. He left a village where every cottage was a healthy home, where all able-bodied labourers wishing for an allotment could have one. A good village school had been established. It may fairly be said that the whole neighbourhood was slowly uplifted by the coming of one quiet life into its midst. What this story tells me is that William Dent was simply faithful. He was faithful to God in the precise circumstances which surrounded him. And in so being, those circumstances changed. The world, his immediate world, became a better place. Of course, stories can be abused and distorted. The richness and depth of metaphor, which point towards the golden threads of love, can be converted into oppressive manacles of literality. Such is the power of fundamentalism in any religion. But cumulatively, what Quaker stories tell me is that if I open myself up to it, 
even the darkest recesses of my being can be penetrated by light. That at the very deepest centre, our darkness may be so infused by light that our root drivers begin to change. They are transformed and our lives can begin to demonstrate light and love. Not that any of this is easy. Those old words pertain. Worship. Discipline. Sacrifice. Though we may find that these words need to be rewritten to cope with how we fit inside them. And furthermore, rather than reading these words in the framework of punishment and guilt, we can see them in the context of a loving purpose in which we flourish and we grow. There's much work to do to move toward this. My small local meeting is currently trying to decide whether we are called to move from the art centre which has been our spiritual home for the last 20 odd years, or stay where we are despite some considerable disruption to our silence by um, children in art class, choirs, people coming in wanting cups of tea, and keys, such stuff. In our last meeting on this, despite strong feeling on both sides, we recognised that we were not trying to force a particular decision. What we were trying to do was to place ourselves in a state of being where the decision flowed through us. To do so, we have to remove much clutter and much cumber. One person feeling the burden of responsibility for opening up every week. Another person, another a person being considerably irritated by the staff of the centre who sometimes forget that we're turning up that week. Each issue to be patiently worked through until, in time, it will be clear. Right action will flow effortlessly because we have placed ourselves in right relation to spirit. I read this as a metaphor for our internal world. We need to work patiently with ourselves and others, finding and removing those obstacles which stand in the way of us, placing ourselves more securely, more surely, more trustingly, in the hands of a loving spirit. This may take a long time. I have to be patient with myself. I see how patient God has been and continues to be with humanity. For love is still very far from being the first motion of our world. As Quakers, we use the term right ordering. This phrase helps us to understand that the world is a disordered place. I don't mean tsunamis, floods, fire and the like. We are embodied in a material universe, flesh and blood, bone and sinew, nerve centres and synapses, all present their challenge and joys. But rather, right ordering helps us understand that the world is not as it should be. That congealed human structures inhibit the free flow of loving purpose through the world. That which Gerard Manley Hopkins calls deep down dearest freshness is fundamentally designed to flow easily just as the milk of human kindness is intended to flow. 
yet clearly it does not. And the consequences of this can be seen all around us. Where we are offered abundance, we're trapped in a nightmare economic system in which my gain is another's loss. Inequality and injustice abound. Pax Romana might be consigned to history, but power still seeks to rule by fear and division. What can our Quaker response be to such a disordered world? We can remind ourselves that while discipleship generates the expectation that we will be as innocent as the dove, this expectation does not preclude us from being as wise as the serpent. And our wisdom, our subtlety, our intelligence, our wealth of learning can be brought to bear as we look at such injunctions as walking the extra mile. Many of you will be familiar with Walter Wink's transliteration of this injunction into a narrative. In the context of the time, a Roman centurion could compel a local inhabitant to carry his pack for a mile. <coughs> By insisting on walking the extra mile, the Palestinian peasant both places the oppressor in the position of offender and exposes the nature of the oppressive law. Similarly, first friends use the strength provided by their Quaker hedge to challenge surrounding oppressive structures. In their way of dress, of speaking, their refusal to doff hats or take oaths, even apparently their way of walking with directness and purpose as opposed to a restoration swagger. In all these ways, early friends undermined and made apparent the pretension, pomposity and ugliness of the surrounding cultural norms. In rejecting these oppressive aspects of their surrounding culture, Quakers were walking cheerfully over the world. They were walking cheerfully over that stuff in order to call forth the implicit goodness embedded in the heart of the universe. And they could do this because they knew, they knew, experientially, they had encountered that which Pennington calls the inward substance of all that appears. To both live in the world whilst challenging the fundamental presuppositions on which it is based is as radical now as it was in Roman-occupied Palestine or in Restoration Britain. So I'll just quote um, Catholic pastor Henri Nguyen. Every real revolutionary is challenged to be a mystic at heart. And those who walk the mystical way are called to unmask the illusory quality of our society. Harvey Gilman describes us Quakers as a community of practical mystics. Sincerely following the Quaker way opens up the universe and reveals its true condition. So perhaps a rounded programme of educating for action would help young people, young people help all of us, to, to develop the inner strength the necessary psychological and spiritual resilience which would allow us to live both live in the world and to respond more fully and authentically to the leadings of the Spirit. And stories can help us by offering inspiration and authentic example. They embody the truth that it is indeed possible to live in this way.
A key part of the continuing Abrahamic story is that we will be called as Abraham, Jesus and Muhammad were all in turn called. But if we're not careful, we generate the expectation that we will be called into activity. I rather suspect that the call is into ever deeper relationship with that which is the source of the richness, depths and fulfilment of humanity in all its glory. And from this deepening relationship, from this deepening relationship, our calling will emerge. So when the Gospel of Mark tells a story of Jesus' vision of the Holy Spirit, descending as a dove, and he heard the voice of God saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. I do not read it as the experience of one man at a single defining moment in time, but rather as a metaphor for the whole of humanity and for the whole of history. Thomas Merton puts it, I am a member of the human race, and what glorious destiny is there, since the word was made flesh and became too a member of the human race. It may be that God will be found in the grand sweep of history and the broad abstraction of salvation. But my faithfulness to loving purpose is divined, defined and tested in my, responsibility, in my response to the particularities of my life, to the fullness of the situation which confronts me now, at this very moment. And so it is. In our personal narrative, the intimate life history of each of us, where we can find the experience of God written on our hearts. God comes to us in the form of our lives, says Richard Raw. And this narrative, this narrative, can be founded on the sure and certain knowledge that we are an articulation of the divine. We can recognise and truly comprehend that our lives are the only opportunities God has to speak across the world. The word is made flesh in us so that we can be a living minute, a human record of God's presence on earth. And the power of that word is weakened if I diminish my unique significance in any way or if I diminish that of others. It's not good enough for me to wish I had more competence, more energy, greater ability to focus, capacity to work harder. This is not humility, it is immature spiritual formation. True spiritual formation is the sustained effort to grow as a human being in order for that word to be spoken more truly, more powerfully, more authentically through me. And in order to live more into our humanity, the more deeply we are obliged to engage with the ground and source of, the humanity, of our humanity. The glory of God is the human being fully alive, says Irenaeus. And the glory of the human being is the beholding of God. The more deeply we live with the Spirit, the more our capacity for compassion and loving kindness increases. And that loving kindness flows through us according to the design of our unique, particular creation. For the book of our lives is not one where we are held to account. 
but rather a text in which can be found a loving hand shaping us. And in this respect, Brian Boyd is right. It's not a text that's easy to read. But in contrast with his celebration of Homeric total perspective, I prefer that offered by the nature writer Robert McFarlane. He says that it, it's the mountaineer who longs to look down and outward onto total knowledge. The pilgrim, the pilgrim is always content with looking along and inwards to mystery. And as a pilgrim, I revel in the mystery that I am being carved by the ever-flowing river of God's love. And this river of love carves me so that the map of my life might more nearly represent the geography of my unique individual soul. And as in geography, I need to read my personal landscape in its completeness. The pilgrim path is a journey towards wholeness. The euphony between wholeness and holiness is not, to my mind, accidental. Wholeness is a kind of perfection. It's not perfection in the Greek sense of faultlessness. It's rather the completion of a lived reality, of seeing wholeness and ful fulfilment in what is, at any particular moment in time. And what this means is that each one of us has to fully accept our personal history, whatever is involved in that, knowing that in this world nothing is wasted. In the realm that we are talking about, nothing is wasted. Think of a great tree blown down in a terrific storm. When a craftswoman examines the rings in a slice of that great manifestation of nature, she can see all the things that have gone into its growing. The knocks and hardships which made that tree what it is. The long, lean years of drought. The harsh winters. The trauma inflicted by lovers carving their name. The bright sun, the spring rain. They're all written indelibly in the heart of that tree. It might have suffered damage that can never be put right, but that's inextricably part of the makeup of that tree. And the crass person does not laminate over these outward flaws, these seeming imperfections. Rather, polishes the wood so its essential character shines forth. And we can only gaze in wonder at this perfection in which the apparent flaws play an essential part. Sometimes the rivers of adversity run deep. And much is required of some people. Whilst we may accept the vicissitudes which life has visited upon us, it can be more difficult, more challenging, and far more demanding to accept history without bitterness or anger. In his book Rebel Land, Christopher de Belair spends time among the Kurds of southeastern Turkey as they fight against the Turkish state for their language and culture. And as he talks to people there, he becomes aware of a darker history. That history is made transparent on his journey back home, where he finds himself sitting next to an Armenian travelling companion. 
This person shows him a silver belt he'd bought from a Kurdish man in eastern Turkey, and the Kurd had claimed it was a family heirloom. But the author's fellow traveller explains that in fact this belt was undoubtedly an Armenian bridal belt. It would have been given to a young woman on her wedding. And it was stolen from her, probably after her rape and murder in that time of Armenian genocide, in that awfulness that was Turkey in the 1920s. On his arrival home, Christopher Belair reflects on these things. I think these things in a neat, well-ordered terraced house in London where I have belts of my own, my family, the nice, reassuring things I inherited from my mother, Supposing these people, these things, were wrenched away from me by an ancestral enemy. Supposing I was robbed of everything in a matter of minutes. I suppose that I too would disregard those principles of love and forgiveness that were instilled in me painlessly as a child. And I would abandon myself to insatiable rage. My ancestors were all miners of coal. For generations they worked underground. They were never systematically enslaved. The women raped. My people removed from the plot of earth where they'd lived for generations. But I do understand resentment. I understand anger. For a long time in my life, a very long time, an internal incandescent rage could flare when I thought of my forefathers and their forefathers slaving for coal in candlelit holes of heat, sweat, dust, while others across generations lived lives of ease, comfort and well-being, soaring by effortless achievement to positions of comfort, wealth and power. It would be very easy Very easy. To use past experience to claim victimhood. To say the suffering of my people entitles me to claim a special privilege over others. It is, instead, part of mature spirituality which refuses to inflict pain on the world. Which says that my sense of injustice, my experience of desolation, is not an opportunity for me to demand that the world be reshaped in the light of my hurt, but rather that I am refashioned, so as to recognise the pain and hardship places me at one with a suffering humanity. And so, in my very limited way, I imitate the protagonist in that great story, the story which is not of itself true but nevertheless points me in the direction of truth. For what is the crucifixion story but a metaphor of transformation? The movement of spirit which takes us to a place we cannot aspire to and barely desire, yet where we are at one with the spirit and the spirit flows through us unceasingly. And the end of history will be when justice flows like a river and righteousness like an everlasting stream. Grounded in love, we have no desire to wound manipulate or dominate. Walking with assurance is not to strut arrogantly. 
action can be an emanation of the divine flowing through us. What does this look like in the busy workaday world? I can only tell you that my life is very much a text in progress. Hints followed by guesses, to quote T.S. Eliot again. It doesn't take much to knock me off my centre. But when troubled, I bring to mind the ending of the Jesus story as told by Mark. Not the confident finale as is written, but the more authentic conclusion related in chapter 16, verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This ending of the story is baffling, unsettling. In place of a comforting narrative of roundedness and consummation, the disciples are left doubting the validity of their experience of the living Christ as they knew him. I am heartened by reading Ched Myers. Heartened. For those of us born in a pre-digital age, we might remember telegrams. And we might remember that the telegraphic address of a friend's house was N. Harton, London. So I am in Harton by reading Ched Myers in his book, Binding the Strong Man. In constructing his alternative order, Mark offers not fantasy, but transformed reality. The kingdom was a laborious project to be undertaken by human disciples in the real world. I read Ched Myers to say that we are left with such an ending because it is our responsibility to put in place the circumstances whereby the love of God can flourish in our lives and in so doing fructify the world around us. That real world which is broken, is suffering, and is still crying out for the healing balm of God's love. Our actions, sourced by our relationship with the divine, can yet allow loving kindness to flow freely. So as we educate ourselves in order to educate others, let us hope that the work of this weekend can be underpinned by our faithfulness. Let us hope that we can be enabled to listen more attentively, to act more sweetly, and to lay strong foundations for others to build on what we achieve.